This program is made possible with support from Connecticut Humanities. Election Day 2020 promises to be like no other. The coronavirus pandemic has drastically reshaped our lives from how we work, how we teach our children, how we socialize, and yes, how we vote. Across the country and across Connecticut, your average voter has more to grapple with this year than the question of just which candidate should I vote for. Now voters must also consider, should I vote in person or should I vote by mail? Should I vote on election day or long in advance? At the same time, some election workers and public officials are struggling to keep up with changes brought on by the pandemic. And on top of all of these, communities of color have issues with the vote that are unique to them. This is The Vote. I'm John Henry Smith. For the next hour, we'll put the candidates for our public office aside as we look at how voting is changing, who's affected by those changes, and what we are doing to make sure our election systems work as intended. To start, we visit with municipal election officials as they work to mail out tens of thousands of absentee ballots and as they plan to count them through election night. Connecticut Public's Ali Oshinsky has the story. It's more than a postage and a stamp. And, uh, because I think many people think of the absentee balloting process as just an envelope and you put a stamp on it and you put a little ballot in it. But the tracking is the, the, the hard part and the complex part. When you go to the polls, you're handed a ballot. That one piece of paper is really all it takes to cast your vote. And by the time your ballot has passed through the tabulator, it really doesn't matter which voter casts which ballot as long as that vote is counted. Absentee ballots require a few more pieces of paper. Like envelopes and applications, voters need to apply for an absentee ballot. That comes to them through the mail, along with an envelope with a personalized barcode. And instead of that person coming into the polls, it's the envelope that does the traveling, carrying with it the vote and the identification of the person who cast it. The vote itself is anonymous. The envelope is not. And that's what keeps the system secure. Most people think the ballots are sacred. In fact, you could take some, these are old, but you could take some new ones. You cannot do anything with a ballot. It's the envelope that tracks you as a voter in which that ballot is situated. That's that envelope with the serial number and the tracking number. That's what's the most important part. And that's the sacred part you have upstairs, right? That is, yes, exactly. Back in April, the unknown nature of the coronavirus pandemic delayed the state's primary. Leaders looked to absentee ballots as an option of a socially distanced vote. And in August, the system designed to handle 3 to 5 percent of the vote was repurposed to handle the weight of much, much more. How many ballots are you expecting to receive back? Between 30 and 40,000. During the primaries, we did 55% of the total vote was done by us. So maybe we do 50%, but that would make it 30,000, 35,000. If there was an upswing in cases, we would go to 40,000. And this is uh, our job to be ready for 40,000 or even more if the situation would become dire. Two out of every three ballots cast in the primary were absentee. This November, election officials expect voters will feel more comfortable going to the polls, but they still have to be prepared. In August, the state did most of the mailings. Now it's on the municipal clerks, and the volume of applications creates a lot of work. Yeah. Fulfillment portion is the, is the harder part. So now we're physically having to mail all the ballots out versus having a mail house to do that process. So yeah, that's the, the most frustrating part is to have to, by hand, I stuff all those envelopes with the ballot. Usually we get between 500 and 1,000 applications in each day that have to be turned into a ballot. And by statute, it used to be the turnaround 
had to be 24 hours. We need to get the ballot out the next day if your, if your application comes in today. Uh, we get 48 hours now. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here again. Hi, Shay. So you scan the barcode, the barcode on there. See, we never had that before. We've never, we never, this is all new to us. Oh. So okay. here, it pulls up the record. So here's the ballot that we put in, and this is the number that now the computer itself assigns the numbers. Before the old system, we had to use the number on the envelope and type it in and type in the information. We had to type in the date, what if we were mailing it. Now with the state system, we just scan it and everything goes in for us. So once we come in here, we put everything on the desk with the labels, the envelopes and everything. And the next crew will come in. The certain people are chosen. They come in, they take this, they go back to their desk and they put the labels on the envelopes and they put labels on the outer envelopes, which we call the mailing envelope. Once that's done and they check um, against the applications, just to make sure we didn't miss an address or something. Once that's all done and completed, they're put together and this is all ready to go out. So this has everything but the ballot in it. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and that's where all the work goes, right? right? Yes, right. The ballot's just the last thing. Oh, yeah, <laughs> once the ballots come in, then it's a whole nother you know, job after that. We can start as early as 6 a.m. on the day of the election. The town clerk is the one in Connecticut who administers the absentees. The registrars by statute are in charge of counting them. And so once we take possession of them, we have to open the outer envelope, remove the B envelope, which is the signed envelope, and then separate and eventually go back and separate the B envelope and take the, uh, the ballot itself out. Uh, reason being is so we don't see how you voted. So we're checking for signatures, we're checking for everything that we need um, to, to finally open that last envelope. Once that last envelope is opened, we can then place it to a tabulator. And the moderator would insert this in the back after doing the initial tests. This is a different election. We're not used to in Connecticut a all mail-in system. We do not have um, the infrastructure for that. So we're still doing what we've always done. It's just gonna take some more time um, to get everything processed. But the reality is we want as registrars to make sure that the results are accurate the first time around, that we're not giving results because we're trying to rush. The extra time involved in the absentee ballot process may make for a late night for registrars on November 3rd, but that envelope is essential. It's a stand-in for the voters who can't make it to the polls this year, and it will ensure each ballot comes from a registered voter and gets to the polls securely. The voter ought to know that the application comes from you and we will make sure it does come from you. That ballot is tracked through a serial number that belongs to you that goes into the envelope and the outer envelope and your ballot is in that and comes back in it such that we track which number is associated with you and therefore which ballot you return without me ever looking at the content of the ballot. That goes to the other office. That system was set up by the Secretary of the State, but the execution of that work is entirely in the hands of town and city election officials. The last of the absentee ballots will be collected at 8 p.m. on election night. Voters should mail ballots with ample time to arrive at town hall that day. Or if there isn't adequate time in the mail, voters should drop their ballots at the secure boxes outside their town hall. And the thousands of voters who won't physically make it to the polls this year will finally be there, in envelope form. And from there, the counting will begin. Joining me now to talk more about the mechanics of voting during the pandemic are two people who are intimately familiar with the voting process. First, we have Anna Posniak. She is the town clerk of Windsor. She's also the president of the Connecticut Town Clerks Association. And we have Sue Larson, the Democratic Registrar of Voters in South Windsor. And she is the president of the Registrar of Voters Association of Connecticut. Two heavy hitters, and we are very pleased to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So first, Anna, first question for you, and I'll bid, this statement sort of goes out to both of you. you know, with the coronavirus continuing to infect and kill around the country, many people, they are understandably a little reticent about going outside and being in public spaces. Uh, imagine this, among many things, has made life for 
clerks uh, exceptionally challenging during this time? Anna, how are they holding up and how's the stress level? Well, it certainly is an unprecedented unprecedented election in uh, this year. Um, many town clerks had to hire additional staff members um, to help assist with the absentee ballot applications that we're seeing coming in. It's a very large, high volume um, compared to years past. Um, for instance, in 2016, I issued a grand total of 2,000, or excuse me, uh, 1,200 absentee ballots. Um, with this particular uh, election, I've already issued over 5,000 absentee ballots. Just so, a few more. Yes, exactly. So uh, additional staff, um, we've had to purchase additional technology. And, um, you know, it's, it's a daunting task, but the town clerks want voters to know that they should have confidence in the system and that we will get the absentee ballots out to all voters who want to vote safely in this election. So how will we be, we've spent so much time during this election cycle talking about absentee ballots. Some people will still go in and want to vote in person. How will the in-person voting experience change? Mostly because of the fact that we, we're going to have to do social distancing. So, you know, be, the process of going to the polls the, um, will remain the same. But as I said, the, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to have social distancing. So lines that used to look reasonable um, are now going to look like it must be two hours to, um, to get through the lines, three hours to get through the lines, only because of social distancing. Your, um, once you get into the polls, you'll find that all of the poll workers will be wearing masks, face shields, using plexiglass between themselves and the voters. Um, and we'll try to, as quickly as possible, get them from point A to out the door um, in order to keep the lines moving, in order to protect the, the voters. So we're adjusting to make sure that everybody that comes to the poll um, feels safe when they go in to vote from the start of the check-in all the way to when they exit out the door. So Anna, what happens if your ballot is not postmarked by election day? Any absentee ballot um, must be received by the town clerk by eight o'clock. We're not a postmark state. So even if it's postmarked November 3rd and we receive it after the election, we will not be able to count that absentee ballot. Well, now they can't put it in the mailbox, but they can still drop it in one of the drop boxes on Election Day, correct? Absolutely, yes. So um, okay. this past summer, the Secretary of the State provided each town um, with an absentee dip ballot drop box. Voters can use them. They're very secure. Town clerks are checking them multiple times a day. They're checking them on the weekends. And the box will be available to voters until 8 o'clock that evening. Um, at 8 o'clock, town clerks have a mechanism to lock that box to prevent any ballots from going in after that point. Well, you've got to really plan this thing pretty well. If you think there's any chance that putting it in the mail will cause it to not get there, you probably should take it to a drop box. Correct. Correct. What about, uh, you, you hear a fair amount of skepticism from some people about the clerk's, the registrar's ability to pull this election off in a way that is fair and free of fraud. Uh, a lot of those claims have been debunked, but for those people, I mean, what, how do you placate them? How do you make them, make them feel better that this will be a, this will be a, a completely fair, fraud-free process? In Connecticut, we already have election laws that are in place that we've been using for years that have maintained the integrity of our elections. Um, when we are processing absentee ballot applications into the state voter registry system, it will alert us that this is a duplicate ballot. And clerks were also taking the extra measure that we are going to find the second application because um, we've seen that voters were submitting two applications because they were concerned uh, when we receive ballots back. On, uh, we also then record them into the state voter registry system. And then that will automatically put an A next to the person's name on the official checklist. And this will prevent the voter from being able to go to the polls and vote at uh, a ballot at the polls as well. Um, and the registrar voters do check the absentee ballots against the checklist. On the day of the election, we will not turn anything over to the registrar voters until we are certain that person has not voted at the polls. 
Oh, the Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill, says she has sent out $2 million to towns to help them with the election process. What are, what, what are those funds being spent on? And do you all feel like you have enough money and resources to do your job effectively, given the deluge of absentee ballots that are, have arrived and are on their way? Grant funds were used to purchase new computers. Um, we had to purchase new uh, label makers. Um, each one of the absentee ballot sets that goes out has two different types of labels that are on it that we must uh, affix to the envelopes. We've been using it to hire staff to help us to process those applications. Um, we are uh, buying extra voting booths to, for the polls. Um, we're trying to use them to make sure that we have a sufficient supplies to accommodate both um, absentee voting and then for those people who want to go to the polls. How much more staff? So if, say, an office usually is staffed by two people, how many more people? You're doubling staffs or what, what, is, what, are, you, what are you finding? So, um, for instance, in Windsor, I have uh, myself and two full-time staff. I brought on four extra staff members, and I've also been utilizing um, several volunteers who are coming in um, during the day also to assist. Um, you have the um, Stanford, which brought in 50 extra workers to be able to process the high volume of applications. So I would say a good portion of the funds is being utilized for the staff that we need to be able to process the absentee ballot applications. Finally, um, what are your expectations for Election Day in terms of you know, when do you expect to start? Do you expect to be counting all night, uh, all week, all month? How do you expect it to go? Well, the um, the legislature has allowed us 96 hours to get all the results in. So basically what we're anticipating is that we will be counting um, to late in the evening on um, election night and then again the next day. Um, we have two issues that, uh, as far as the registrars are concerned with, as far as getting making sure we've got all the numbers in. You're going to get preliminary numbers that night. But I wouldn't expect the full, you know, to get good, solid numbers until Wednesday. And I think we can expect lots of caffeine at clerks' offices across the state. It sounds like there's a big job. Yes, uh, absolutely. All the clerks. Yes, absolutely. Sue Larson and Apozniak, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We turn now to the different ways voting this year affects different members of Connecticut's largest minority populations. We start with my community. The black community. The death of George Floyd in Minnesota on the heels of countless other brutal deaths of black people at the hands of police has both enraged and energized black people across this country. In response, black people, joined by an unprecedented number of sympathizers from other demographics, have protested in the streets with a passion not seen since the civil rights marches of the 1960s. The question is, Will black people turn those protests into votes? According to the Pew Research Center, 2016 was the first presidential election in 20 years that saw black voter turnout decline. A number of organizations partnered together recently to make sure such a decline doesn't happen again this November. I'm standing outside of the Urban League of Greater Hartford headquarters. It has been 56 years since this chapter of the National Urban League came into existence. And in all of that time, they have worked tirelessly to promote economic empowerment in the local black community. One of the ways you promote economic empowerment is to make sure that your voices are heard in the places of power in Hartford, in Washington. And that's why on this day, the Urban League was partnering with Black Entertainment Television on a national voter registration effort called Reclaim Your Vote. Not only was the event a great chance to get people of color involved in the political process, it was also a great chance for us to talk with black voters ahead of the November election. This year, um, as much as any year in 2020, is a year that we need to get as many people out and registered. Uh, this election uh, means a lot to the country, and um, I'm, we're proud to be a part of the, of the campaign this year to reclaim your vote and have as many black Americans registered as possible. There's a lot of history of black people being disenfranchised in this country, and a lot of fight and a lot, a lot of blood was spilled to get the right to vote. What does the right to vote mean to you? 
The right to vote means to me, even if it seems small to some, it's a voice, some type of voice and way to have an input on what goes on in the world. So as small as it might seem to some, I think it's very impactful. This is the first time that BET and the Urban League have gotten together mm -hmm. uh, to have this national uh, day of reclaiming the vote. Uh, does that happen without George Floyd? I think he made a difference. That, that, that incident definitely made a difference. And just not George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. There's, I mean, and this just goes on and on and on. I remember watching it and I was screaming at the TV, saying, get off his neck. Get off his neck, you know what I'm saying? We find corporations, um, communities, legislators, all turning their eye to the entire compass of what has happened to black Americans historically, people of color, black and brown Americans. And so I think George Floyd has given a, an international, but more importantly, a localized rally, uh, a, a rally cry for everyone to be uh, part of a, a, a community, a collective community to be heard. Do you feel like Black people, under, uh, we as black people understand en masse that it's time to get out here and vote. I feel like we should understand it. And I feel like we spend too much time thinking about presidential, not to take away from it, but local politics matters. So as soon as somebody says I don't vote, they're not thinking about their state reps. They're not thinking about their senators, their governors, the ones who make the immediate decisions that they can actually touch, talk to. You know, they automatically think about the presidential level. And I would like to say local politics does matter. And then we also don't think about the fact that when you are registered to vote, you serve jury duty. So when I have a conversation with somebody who has a record, I had that conversation like, okay, cool. You might not be able to vote or might not be able to accept vote, but you want to push that out there because it, you want to have a jury of your peers. And if we're or ducking you no know, jury duty or we're not registered to vote, we don't even have jury duty. We don't know the impact that it makes on the criminal level as well when it comes to the justice system. When you talk to your friends, your family, what are you hearing in terms of what people, what black people are afraid of this year when it comes to voting? Um, I hear a lot of people thinking it'll be rigged or it's being set up this way. Um, there's a lot of fear that their vote might not actually count this year or might get lost, might not be put in the right way. So there's a lot of fear in people not trusting that this is gonna go as smooth as it should. What are you hearing from our black people about how they're feeling about this election? Sick and tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, a lot of them want change. They want to change the face that's in the seat. They are angry and upset with things. What is your prediction for the turnout of the black vote this time around here in this area in the state of Connecticut? That's a good question. And I think the black vote is going to turn out. I think there are elements of this year's election that, um, that hearken unto what we saw in 2008 and 2012. Number one, you have representation. And Kamala Harris, you have um, a person of African, whose heritage is of African descent. Uh, you have a person who has a connection to the black community through her attendance at Howard University as an HBCU. She's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And you have a connection to, to Joe Biden, to Barack Obama. So I think those things attract people back to the process. And so, uh, you know, many, there were many comparisons in 2016 to the turnout to the prior two elections. Um, and they showed the drop off in black participation, black American participation. That was a little bit misleading because the numbers dropped back to the, the, the turnouts in 2004 and 2000 and so forth, which is more consistent with the level of participation. I've heard this thought process that my vote doesn't matter. Yeah. They're all the same. It really, who's, who's going to care if I come out and whether I vote or whether I do not? How pervasive are you finding that is leading up to these 2020 elections among black people? I think it's very pervasive. You know, I think the challenge is that so many people, um, particularly in the black American community, have this commitment to be authentic, to be genuine and sincere, and to see the problem is more systemic than um, transactional. And so their efforts and the people who come from this perspective say, you know, I don't want to participate if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, contributing to a system that's already broken. So I want to stay away from it until, and, 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 and um, abstain from voting, voting until the system is fixed. And so we recognize that that's not a healthy way to behave. As soon as I was eligible, I went down and registered and I made sure I put my votes in. Was that, uh, was that the way it was for your friends? 
Uh, yes, for the most part. Some people, I did try to convince that your vote does count. A lot of them are saying that. They don't believe they have that much of an impact on what's going on. But um, I try to encourage them and make them know that, listen, we need every vote. Okay, so I'll play devil's advocate. Well, what's changed for black people? What, 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 what's ever changed? I mean, what, what difference does it make if I vote for Hillary Clinton or the Tasmanian devil? What, what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. You have to, we have to come together. We have to be strong, unite, and do this together. If we have people who don't want to put in the effort, then we're going to have a lot of issues that we're not going to get solved. So we got to stick together, vote, make sure we get the right people in office, and make sure we get that change going for our community. Yeah, 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 but they're all crooks. They're all crooks. They all want, they, they, they'll, they'll lie to you and tell you one thing, then when they get in the office, they'll, they'll do whatever they want to do. So then I would say, who would you like to see in there? We have local people that I grew up with that are in politics. So if you have an issue with that, raise somebody up. Your children could be the next president, could be the next senator, could be the next my, governor. My children. Yes, sir. Your children could be the next senator, next governor, the next head of the Board of Education, where we have you know, certain things that are going on that you don't like to see. Well, shoot, I got to go vote. I got to go. Thank you. I got to go. <laughs> Here now to talk about the past, present, and future of the black vote in Connecticut is Connecticut State Treasurer Sean Wooden. So glad to have you with us, sir. Great to be with you, John. Well, Mr. Treasurer, you certainly have the bona fides when it comes to voting and elections. Not only have you won two out of the three elections you've been a part of, but I understand not long after college, you served as the Connecticut State Director for Project Vote, a national voter registration and education program. I, I understand that your counterpart in that organization in another city was uh, somebody pretty famous. Yes. And so, so my counterpart at the time who ran the city of Chicago was Barack Obama. I've heard of him. And, yeah. you know, it kind of makes me look like an underachiever now, <laughs> but, um, but it's so uh, interesting. So that's, that's where we, we met. But I was a Connecticut State Director for Project Vote, which was a nonpartisan voter registration, education, and get out to vote effort, right? And all three components were, were very important and, you know, very different from just, you know, a lot of times we have voter registration drive, but as we know, it's about the voters that turn out on election day. And that's what's critically important. That's what changes the outcome of elections. And so we tried to follow voters and educate them on the significance from a policy perspective of what close elections, um, how the different outcomes can change the direction of their lives. So you say registration, education, and getting out the vote was very important then. It's very important now. What's the key to getting out the black vote this November? The, the key is connecting the dots between how is this going to change my life? The reality uh, back then, right, and I should add, this was focused on largely urban communities, black and brown communities, and poor communities. Right. So very targeted focus. And back then, the problem was the cynicism that government doesn't work for me, that there's no one that speaks for me or to my issues. And right now, uh, the, it's the same challenge, only worse, because we have to give voice to the needs of the community and not just go collect votes, but deliver results from a policy perspective. So I think connecting those dots become critically important. We have this moment, as you referenced, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and we could go on. Uh, is this moment, it seemed different in this summertime. Is this moment truly different? Do you really, do you really think that it's going to make the difference when it comes to the ballot box in November? I mean, obviously back in 2016, you know, black folks did not show up That's to right. the polls in enough numbers, uh, especially when compared to 2012 and 2008. Is this, the events of this year, will they be enough to make the difference, to, to change that dynamic and turn the arrow back the other direction, upward? We've already seen uh, record n numbers of uh, voting by mail and absentee ballot. In. Within that, we've seen higher numbers of African-Americans voting in those vote by mail numbers. Twice as much from the uh, previous election. So those are all indicators of the interest. In the primaries, some of the primaries earlier this year, we've seen long lines. But what did you see? 
you saw people sitting down with their lawn chairs and snacks and said, we're not going anywhere. We're going to vote, even in places where they have sought to undermine and disenfranchise voters by limiting the number of polling places, by making it more difficult. Right. You've seen a level of determination uh, in the black community uh, and other communities that we just haven't seen in quite some time. And I, I believe that will translate into this November's election. As I talk to people, I'm beginning to get the, I'm beginning to hear more and more, I wanna make sure, I wanna make sure that vote counts. So I'm going to the polls. I'm not saying it's most people I talk to, but I'm hearing it enough. What are you hearing? Are you hearing the same I, thing? I, I am hearing the same thing. And, and, and I want to strongly encourage people that the, the system will work. You know, you, and if you don't want to vote by mail, go to a drop box we have where you can fill out your ballot and put it in one of these safe drop boxes. And that takes out one additional step. So I want to encourage people to do that. But I'm hearing absolutely what you're hearing. And in one case, I know of a, a couple that they have they live in Florida, but they've been out of Florida for months uh, be, because of the COVID conditions. And they are going back to Florida uh, two days before the election because they do not trust that their vote will actually be counted if they do the absentee ballot. So that that is that is a real thing, um, which which I understand. But um, for those of you, you know, if you're willing to go out and be safe uh, at the polls and that makes you feel most comfortable, do it. But there are other safe means to cast your ballot here in Connecticut. What worries you the most about people of color and and their ability to vote unencumbered in November? First, I start with with the voter right, and black people that cynicism or complacency. Right. Um, right. We're seeing signs that, uh, that it won't be there as much in the past, but that's the first thing, right? And just making sure we, we get enough accurate information out there to, to inspire people to vote. Um, but the flip side of that is I worry about misinformation. I worry about some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing week after week after week, uh, you know, coming from, unfortunately, our president. Among others. It, um, um, among others. Yeah. He just happens to have the biggest megaphone uh, in, in the country. Sure. So I get concerned about like sowing the seeds of doubt, right? And, and translating, you take all of this different stuff that's said, translating into your vote may not actually be counted or translating into your vote may not matter. Right. And once people begin to believe that, they pull away from being participants in the democratic process. And that worries me when, you know, as, as an African-American man, you know, you know I, I just grow up skeptical. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you add all of these pieces into it, I think it could easily increase that skepticism. So that worries me. Um, here in Connecticut, I, I do not worry about someone going to, to the voting booth and being turned away based upon their race. So we're going to end with this. What is your prediction for people of color and the November election? Uh, in particular, I mean, do you, see, do you foresee a greater turnout? Do you foresee greater interest not only in the presidential election, but in down ballot elections. I believe we're going to see a dramatically increase uh, turnout among African Americans from what we saw in 2016. We're going to see that at the top of the ticket uh, for the presidential and vice presidential, and that is going to carry through. There's going to be some drop off, but increasingly, uh, people are understanding that kind of local elections matter, um, and. So that's what I think we're going to see. And given everything that's happening, you know, every week there's a new, there's a new twist. Um, so it won't be for lack of awareness that this election is taking place and that our country is, is in a moment of crisis, right? So this is the most patriotic thing that uh, Americans can do right now to serve our country is to go vote. We're so happy to have you here. He is Connecticut State Treasurer Sean Wooden. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you, John. 
While black voters are Connecticut's second largest minority community, the Latino community is the largest at over a half a million strong. Beyond the concerns typically shared by all people of color in this country around election time, a significant number of Latinos also face barriers in finding their voice at the ballot box imposed by things like immigration status, language, and cultural differences. Connecticut Public's Brenda Leone has more. Pablo Liriano is an 85-year-old urban gardener who is voting for the first time in November's election. Soy dominicano. Yo hoy soy americano. Yo vengo de República Dominicana y le doy gracias primero a Dios que me ha cogido, me abrieron la puerta en este país. Vine legalmente. Eh, día de 10 de julio de 1999. Aquí tengo ya. Voy para 22 años. After waiting more than a decade, he got his citizenship in 2018. Then, he registered to vote at Hartford's Park Street Library, located in Frog Hollow, the heart of the city's Latino community. Casualmente. Cuénteme un poco Casualmente. Sobre yo digo, yo quiero votar y, me, y yo, yo, yo quiero registrarme. Y en estos días, ella me dijo, vamos a hacer una diligencia de una vez, vamos a registrar para que se registre de una vez. Y ella me, me ayudó de una vez. Numbers indicate that there are more Latinos who are eligible to vote, but political scientists say the challenge has been getting them registered. Economic conditions are also a barrier for voter turnout, particularly in the case of Puerto Ricans, who are citizens but are also facing economic hardships after moving to the U.S. Finally, for those families who have temporary addresses or who lack internet access, voting can end up being a real challenge. Graciela Rivera is a librarian at Hartford Public Library's Park Street branch, which is doing outreach to register more people to vote. And this is her neighborhood. She grew up in Frog Hollow. So I would come to the library, work on homework, use the computer and things like that because I didn't have those resources at home. She says the library has seen a 48% increase in voter registration since last year. Rivera says the library also serves as an essential function for people and knows firsthand that resources and information are an important tool. You know, sometimes as, as a Latina myself, right, we, we don't um, think about how important it is to make sure your voice counts because at times we don't feel like our voice matters. The pandemic only exacerbated the need for more resources. Voting is only one of many variables. You know, having to worry about what, I'm, what my kids are going to eat every day might be a, it is a bigger priority than going out to register to vote. So dealing with those things, right, basic necessities that we, that people in the community have to go out and find in order to meet the needs of their family. So that alone, you know, will change your priorities. With Black and Latino communities being hit the hardest by the pandemic, Rivera says that outreach might have to change in order to meet people where they are. Completing a census or registering a vote is not at the top of, of your list when you're going through those things. So um, something to definitely think about. And, you know, we, we sympathize with that. In order to work around these roadblocks, Rivera built connections prior to the pandemic through a virtual women's empowerment group she helps run and community gardens. Sandra Rivera met Graciela Rivera through that women's empowerment group. She arrived from Puerto Rico in 1992 and has been living in Hartford ever since. Unlike Pablo Liriano, who had to wait 15 years for the right to vote, Sandra Rivera has been voting since she arrived from the island. Ya yo ejerzo mi voto aquí en Estados Unidos por ser muy importante el voto. Entonces la diferencia de Puerto Rico es que allá te dan el día libre para que todo el mundo se vaya a votar. As an unincorporated territory of the United States, roughly 3 million Puerto Ricans living on the island will not have an electoral vote in the presidential election. In Sandra Rivera's case, as a citizen of the United States and a resident of Hartford, she can exercise her right to vote by mail. She's also helping others do the same by volunteering at the polls and sharing information on how to access transportation on the day of elections. Algunos es que tienen algunas incapacidades que no pueden escribir, no pueden leer. Y yo le dije, pues yo te, si mientras yo estoy aquí, yo le puedo ayudar. 
a intérprete y lo que pueda entender yo, yo lo puedo ayudar. Oh, wow. Están hermosísimos. While the mechanics of voting in the U.S. differ from other countries, there are other things that set it apart. Pablo Liriano remembers his time in the Dominican Republic when fraud and gunfire were part of the process. But he also says voting there is far more festive. Political parties and their supporters drive through the island in caravans, encouraging voters to participate. ¿Cómo son las elecciones en República Dominicana? Las, re las elecciones en República Dominicana son, eh, eh, no son igual que aquí. Porque allá usted ve que son caravanas por donde quiera, la gente poseando, eh, se juntan los dos partidos, uno y contrario con el otro, y se matan a tiro. Liriano also says he witnessed the 1978 elections in his birth country, where he was a poll watcher during that election night. Y esa noche pensaba que, que, se, que, iba, que iba a haber guerra allá en República una guerra civil. Now, Liriano finds himself in a different electoral system, and it took time. He was able to apply for citizenship because he was both over 55 and had been in this country for at least 15 years. After almost 17 years with his family in New York City, Liriano moved to Hartford three years ago. Yo quería, el anhelo mío era venir a, a este gran país americano para gozar el gran privilegio que ustedes tienen aquí. Y le doy gracias a este país porque ha tenido la libertad que el hombre se merece aquí. Es un país que todo el mundo quiere venir aquí a este país. Because he says Hartford is his new home, and this is where he'll vote. Well, so far in this broadcast, we've heard plenty about how to vote this year, why it's important, and why you should be confident your vote will be counted. But on that last point, the question is, are you confident your vote will be counted? Are you confident your vote will matter? Connecticut Public's Frankie Graziano recently went out to find out. Outside of your local town hall, there's an official State of Connecticut ballot drop box. It's been busy this election season as more than a quarter of the 2.1 million ballot applications sent out to state residents have already been returned. Town and city halls are also a good place for reporters to hang out if they want to talk to absentee voters. And that's how we were able to find some of the people we talked with. Are you voting absentee this year? Yes, how you I vote? am voting absentee. What was the process like for you? Was it a, a new process? Is it something you've done before? Um, I've done it. I've done it in the past. I did it in 2016 um, and then most recently in 2019. So. They, sent us, they sent us the absentee ballot because we're already registered with the town of Killingly. So it's just really sitting at in my kitchen right now till we get closer to election day. Then once that happens, we'll fill it out and send it in. I plan on voting on election day at, at the polls. I did get an absentee ballot, but I'm more inclined to, fit, to vote on election day. Just definitely absentee voting. You're voting absentee? Yes. Why are you voting absentee ballot this year? I'm um, just trying to be safe with COVID and everything. I try to take it seriously and, um, you know, I trust the system and that it'll work and just want to help the best way I can. I generally vote absentee because I work the polls. Like for me, that's why I'm voting absentee ballot because I have a newborn at home. So for me to go out and to be with the public, I don't want to be. The town of Killing this area, our numbers have been very low. I would rather keep it that way and, you know, to keep us separated, keep doing what we're doing right now. It's something I'm comfortable doing because, I mean, we have soldiers overseas that they're still allowed to vote and it's got to still get here one way or another. I'm not really worried about it because again, it's federal law. You can't mess with the mail. So I'm not really worried about it all that much. You're going to put it in like the ballot box or something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Just like you throw in your mail, I want to throw in my ballot. I want to make sure that, uh, that I can get my vote in safely and, 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 and securely so that, uh, my voice gets heard to, to what the next four years for what America will be. Did you look at this like as an opportunity to do uh, absentee balloting? No, like I never would have done it before. I think oh, st strictly because of COVID um, and just trying to be safe. The pandemic is one reason and the other reason is I just had surgery. So going and having to wait 
would be difficult. So level and concern I don't think is extremely high um, because I've done it in the past, but um, I think it, it means a lot more during this election since most people will be voting absentee. People are telling me they're they're doing it either or. I mean, it's whatever their safety is this year because of COVID-19 and things to that fact. Um, so it's like almost 50-50. Since you're not voting at the polls, but you're gonna be working at the polls, so you're gonna be interfacing with people all day. So what makes you comfortable in order to do that this year? If I was that concerned about my health, I would still do it because I love democracy and I love America. And this is the least that I can do in my own little way to continue with our democratic system. I'm not that concerned about health because I think they're doing a fine job. I think our governor here in Connecticut has done an excellent job in keeping us all as safe as we can be. Friends and family, what are they saying about this upcoming election? Nobody trusts anything. Nobody trusts going out to vote. Everybody that I speak to, they wanna vote with a ballot. They want to be in control of how they vote. I mean, some people that I speak to, they want to stand in line and they want to make their vote count it that way. I choose for me to send my ballot. That's how I'm choosing to do it. Most of my friends are comfortable with doing the absentee ballot, and I think most of them will. Yeah, I, def I feel more safe dropping it in the ballot box than just putting it in the mail and hoping it gets here. So it's convenient that it's right here too when I look close by. What are people saying about the election in general? What are the kind of things you're hearing about? Um, I think just being, being able to register is, um, is a big concern. Um, a lot of my friends in here um, are also voting um, absentee and they're, they're all just a little bit concerned on, you know, if it's gonna be counted in the end. Joining us now to talk about why you should be confident your vote will count in November is Connecticut Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, who has been consistent in her messaging that voters should not have to choose between their health and making themselves heard at the polls. Did I get that verbatim, uh, sec Madam Secretary? Almost. You shouldn't choose between your health and your vote. It's that simple. I, I need to go home and practice that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think we got the gist. Yes. Um, the August primary, and I don't think I'm talking out of school when I say this, was a little bit bumpy. Yes. Uh, you had 100,000 absentee ballots requested that went unvoted. You uh, had a mail house that was supposed to send out you know, some uh, applications and they didn't get sent out. So the, the clerks had to take up that slack. What lessons did you learn in your office? What did you guys learn from the primary that you're going to apply to the general? Well, we did uh, pretty much create the system on the fly, uh, and we did mail things out centrally, thinking that that would take the burden off of the local officials who were not equipped to do it at the time. Uh, I think centrally mailing things was difficult. We have so many different ballots in Connecticut, so it took longer than we thought it would. I think we were much better this time. All, all the applications are now out. And I think people are more familiar with it too. I, I think during the primary, it was all new to people. We only usually get about 5% of people who vote absentee ballot, and mostly because they're out of town. Uh, this time, people were just flummoxed by the whole thing. It, it, it's so complicated in Connecticut. You have to mail the application, then right. you fill it out, then you have to mail it back, then they have to mail you your ballot, then you have to mail that back. We have five over 500 different ballot types in Connecticut, so you have to get all that right. So what did we learn? We learned that it's probably easier to do some of this from the local level and just pay them the money to be able to make it happen. Well, I think I saw in one of the newspapers, I think it was The Current, I think they said 57% this time of the ballots submitted were of the absentee variety. Is that the sort of number you understand? No, it was actually 67% from the primary. So we're think about that. That's a huge increase over what we normally get, more than tenfold. So that that's the only problem we really have in Connecticut is we're not used to doing this volume right. of absentee ballots. And we also do everything hyper-local. You know, we have 169 mostly small towns, and every one of them has to manage all this. And uh, it's much easier if you do it centrally like most other states do. Yeah. And, you know, and we were, we were talking off air. I mean, there are potentially mistakes in some of these ballots. You probably saw quite a few mistakes in the primaries that I heard you say you're expecting not to see this time. But mm. you do have to 
you can't just take those outer envelopes and throw them away. Am I, I'm right about well, that. Well, that's right? right. We have to make sure we can retrace some of this. I mean, sometimes ballots will come in and they'll be in an in, inner envelope. And let's say, for, for example, someone forgot to sign that in, inner envelope. Right. Well, most clerks will take the time to actually call that person and say, you know what, you didn't sign your inner envelope, it won't be counted, and give them a chance to do what we call cure the ballot. So if you're going to do that for everyone, obviously, if you have 30,000 people voting just in Stanford alone, they're expecting 30,000 absentee ballots. So this right. becomes a much more complicated process if you're going to keep all those checks and balances. So when we talk about opening up that outer envelope, I mean, you've got to take the time to categorize right. that, that, which, which right. is another time-consuming process that people are considering. That's right, and you have to have a place to keep them. Uh, so all these details matter in this situation, and that's the other reason that we didn't allow them to open the inner envelope and take the ballots out in advance of election day. We still will do all that work on election morning. We'll do it a little earlier this year, 6 a.m., but that's why. We don't want to have to have a chain of custody for the ballots once they're opened and separated from that envelope, you really can't trace them at all. So you're saying you didn't allow the inner envelopes to be opened because my understanding was that by state statute, you weren't allowed to start counting until Election Day. And if you, That's you're not, why. If you can't count, there's no point in opening the inner envelope. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Exactly okay. right. And I, another thing I want to mention, a lot of people think about counting and they think somehow this is being done by hand. It's not. Absentee ballots are counted exactly the same way as all other ballots are counted. They're put through a tabulator, same tabulator you use for the regular vote. So I just want people to understand it really is the same process, only with a lot more protections, actually. Well, I heard that you've been funneling $2 million worth of funds to these, to these state, various towns and cities to help them with the election process is, is, is part of that. Do they need more tabulators for this situation? Well, our tabulators are so old, they don't make them anymore. See, this is another thing we're going to have to discuss after this is all over, that we really are terribly in need of new technology in elections. And you see it now across the country. Uh, you know, most of these election equipment dates back to 2000, when the, the last time we changed our Remember election. Remember what happened in 2000. That's why it changed. There are better tabulators that are more secure because don't, don't forget, we're also dealing with a lot of IT issues now with Russian interference, with people trying to attack our voter registry. Uh, and we did have that happen in Connecticut. We were one of the first 21 states that we were informed by Homeland Security that uh, Russian IP addresses were trying to get into our voter registry. So we have to deal with all those changes as well. And there are newer tabulators that have better uh, security. Well, see, Madam Secretary, I'm really glad you brought that up because I heard that you all hired a military intelligence specialist to help you manage some of the disinformation and misinformation uh, regarding uh, voting that's, that's out there. Is, is that correct? And oh, tell us absolutely. more about that. Yeah, ever since 2016, I've been very involved at the national level uh, trying to get a communication with the Department of Homeland Security so we'll know when these things happen to our systems. We needed someone who would be able to understand the information we're being given from this national uh, security group. It's a committee from Department of Homeland Security. We work with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies to try to identify misinformation specifically about process. We're not looking to talk to about candidates or parties or any of that. What we want to make sure is that when people get information about the election, that it's the right information. So if they really want to, what I would love to see them do is come to our website uh, as the trusted source for exactly where you vote, when you vote, and how you vote. And that's where we're having the problem. Well, all right. So we will end on the question that you spend your entire life answering right now, I'm sure. And I think you know what that question is. You know that there are people out there who are concerned. They say that, well, there are, there are ballots floating in the river. They're being ballot. There are ballots being delivered to dead people. Uh, they say, you know, they, they worry about the postal service. You know, we've heard all the, the, the uh, comedy going on with the postal service th this past summer. Why should people have confidence that this is all going to work and that their ballots are going to be counted the way they're intended to be counted? I think everything we've been discussing, you know, Connecticut, we have never had those kinds of problems here. Now, granted, we've only had 5% of the people getting absentee ballots, but we have a very complicated but effective system of counting absentee ballots. So 
people should not be concerned about that. We're just doing it. It might take us a little longer, but we're going to honor all those protections. And, you know, our lists are really pretty good. Uh, once in a while, we'll have a problem, but most of them are caught. And it's all done at the local level, which, as we've been discussing, is both a, a good thing and a bad thing sometimes. Uh, it's harder to do things centrally. But on the other hand, you've got people right on the ground who are watching all this. And so I think that's a great protection for your ballot. You know, I think in Connecticut, you can be sure your ballot's going to get counted here. We're going to wait till every last person who's eligible to vote and has gotten their ballot in by 8 o'clock is going to get to vote. Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, through all of this stress and strife well, going on with this unprecedented election, you're still approaching it with a smile. Good to see. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. My very great pleasure. <laughs> when I think of my favorite quotes about voting, I think of Peggy Noonan, who said, our political leaders will know our priorities only if we tell them again and again. Once again, this November, you have a chance to make your priorities known. Hopefully, over the course of this hour, you've developed greater confidence that your vote in this most turbulent of election seasons will be counted and that your voice at election time does matter. That's our show. I'm John Henry Smith. Thank you so much for watching The Vote here on Connecticut Public. This program is made possible with support from Connecticut Humanities.